going to be a forge demo. We're going to do a couple of small projects. I'm probably going to go over a whole bunch of uh, boring details of how the uh, equipment works to begin with and uh, some of the tools involved and so forth. And then we'll kind of walk through the process uh, bit by bit uh, and we'll, we'll do a couple small simple projects uh, after we get the fire going and everything going. So bear with me just a second. All right, here we see the uh, basics of a coal-fired forge. Um, normally in the olden days there would have been a, an apprentice standing here uh, ready to make air go through it, uh, but since I'm an electrical engineer uh, we're using a small squirrel cage blower. Uh, I have a couple of adjustments here for airflow, so this is a rough adjustment. Uh, and then there's a on-the-fly adjustment I can make that simply alters the aperture opening there. Kind of see how that vaguely works. More air means more hotter fire, uh, and less air obviously means less. And so you want to be able to switch back and forth pretty quickly so that when you're over uh, at the anvil beating on things, you're not still burning maximum amounts of fuel uh, in the coal forge. Uh, the assembly underneath is generally referred to as a tuyer, probably not pronouncing that right since I'm uh, not French. Uh, this one in particular is made out of an old uh, centrifugal pump casing, uh, plugged here, uh, but these are made out of cast iron and so they tend to last a good long while. This, this down here will tend to get uh, red hot uh, during usage. As for the fire itself, uh, the normal means of starting a coal-fired uh, forge would be to build a small wooden fire. Uh, some kindling down there sitting on that grate that you can see. Um, I don't do that, I, I cheat. Uh, so generally what I'll do is I'll start with a fair amount of uh, findings and coke, uh, small wad of newspaper which I light on fire, fling in here, cover the whole thing in, in coke and some semi-new uh, coal, and crank the blower up and see if I can get it to light. Sometimes works the first time, most of the time, sometimes I have to do it uh, two times really do I have to switch over and uh, do it three times. Um, just a quick note about how coal does work. Uh, coal comes in, in its original form, it'll look like this. You can see it's fairly shiny stuff. Uh, and of course it, it makes your hands black instantly when you touch it. Um, this actually has a fair amount of uh, junk that uh, doesn't burn in it. So when you start cooking this you'll see that I'll have a fair amount of that uh, on the back of the fire mounted over the back of the fire and it'll smoke quite a bit uh, and then on the front of the fire it'll be nice you'll see nothing but red coals uh, and that's because once the the junk is burned off you don't have coal anymore you have what's called coke and coke is this much more brittle very light uh, material that's nothing but fuel ideally you'd, you know you could get it this way uh, but it doesn't come out of the ground that way it comes out of the ground with all the, the gunk in it and there's varying degrees of this uh, some some is better than others. Uh, these are what are called clinkers. Now clinkers is, well, that's what's the garbage that's left uh, from the coal that doesn't get burned off. So you end up with these these kind of things. They make clinking noises when they fall down on the bottom of the tuyer and that's why they're called clinkers. Uh, mostly this is sulfur and other impurities that came in the coal. And you know, yeah, after your fire's done, you, you have to dig these sorts of things out and, and throw them away. I just want to show you folks some of that stuff. So uh, I'm going to put the camera somewhere where ideally it won't catch on fire and uh, we'll try to get the fire started. Just a minute. Actually before I get the fire started I thought I'd take a moment to uh, kind of go over what the projects are that we're going to do. So uh, what I've got here is uh, two pieces of metal. This one is uh, your standard A36 mild steel. Nothing special. You could buy that stuff at Home Depot. Um, we're going to make an S-hook out of this. S-hooks are a uh, kind of a starting block. It's when uh, when blacksmiths start that's kind of the thing they make you make a lot of until you get your uh, bending and pointing and so forth uh, down down pat before you start playing with anything more complicated. Uh, they're kind of neat little devices. I don't know why but the ladies seem to, seem to like them. I guess you can you can hang plants and planters and so on and so forth off of them. So they seem to get snapped up if I throw them on the ground. Uh, Jill usually picks them up and walks off with them. Um, the other piece is a piece of O1 tool steel uh, and we're going to use that to uh, illustrate some of the uh, interesting aspects of what happens when you heat metal up and either cool it slowly uh, or heat it up and, and cool it rapidly because everybody I know always wants to see uh, blacksmiths um, heat metal up red hot and shove it in a fire. Um, Lynn was asking me why it was taking me so long to make this video and I thought I'd 
just illustrate that with a um, shot of the, this is what's called the slack tub. All right, we're gonna try to light the fire. Take one. I've had to turn on the exhaust fan in here, so hopefully everybody can still hear me pretty well. got some good red coming up. I'd like to see some more flames come up. Can't imagine how shell casings got in my coal. All right, yeah, this looks like it's gonna light pretty good. You can see these um, orange flames starting to kick up up here. That's good, that means we've got some good coal lit on this side of the box, fire pot. I'll try to encourage that and see if we can get it to spread around to the other side of the fire box. By this time, the newspaper's all but shot. And, uh, you'll see the coal start to collapse a little bit from time to time. Some of you probably noticed the uh, propane cylinder down here. Don't, don't get excited about that. It does not get warm down here other than the uh, pump casing. Uh, the propane cylinder is for the uh, propane power uh, furnace that I use when I'm doing uh, pattern welded stuff, which as it turns out is going to require a power hammer that I haven't built yet. I don't know how well the camera is going to pick this up, but I thought I'd try to show some folks this. If you can see right in here, there's a, kind of a gummy looking black soot. It's kind of pliable, like melted plastic. That's where I was talking about. That's a piece of fairly raw coal and it's essentially when it's heating up it's squirting out these impurities. Uh, it's probably you know sulfur and whatnot. And that'll fall down and become a clinker uh, as the fire matures. But that's that's what all this smoke here in the back is. This is green coal. It's called green coal. It hasn't hasn't had been burned off yet. Uh, that I'm basically packing into the back end of the fire, trying to get it to coke up. And uh, once I've got enough coke uh, for us to do some project work with, then we'll do that. All right, some information on uh, the, the basic tools. Obviously, the number one tool a blacksmith needs to have is, is an anvil. This is uh, the first piece of equipment. It's just a hard piece of metal that uh, gets uh, behind the, the hot piece and the hammer. Um, there's usually a range of hammers that folks will use. This is probably my favorite hammer. It's a, what is this, a 32 ounce or so. I've got a heavier uh, hammer here. It's a two and a half pound or so. And this, uh, this tip back here is actually used for uh, drawing metal out. So if you strike a hot piece of metal with this, it'll tend to make it move uh, away from this. So if it was a flat piece, the, it would get longer in each direction when you hit it here. Of course, that, that bends the metal also. And we'll see how all that stuff works out as we go through. And we've got planishing hammers and some other equipment. Uh, the other piece you have to have, uh, since you're not going to be grabbing hot pieces of metal with your hand, uh, are tongs. And you'll notice I'm wearing a glove on my left hand. I'll keep that on mainly because it helps dampen the vibration uh, when I'm hitting the metal with the hammer. There's some vibration that comes back through the tooling. It's kind of cold today. Uh, that's kind of uncomfortable. Uh, so I'll keep the glove on, but I won't have a glove on my, uh, on my hammer hand just so I can tell where I'm getting. And obviously if you hear this kind of noise when I'm uh, actually moving some metal, that's gonna be bad because that means I'm missing the metal I'm aiming at. So uh, hopefully we won't hear too much of that. All right, I think we've got a fire that's clean enough inside there. I don't know if you can see. We've still got some of this uh, yellow out here. This is uh, the external pieces of coal. You can see if they're burning like this, they're actually still trying to turn into coke instead of coal. 
Whereas if you look at some of these under pieces, they're bright cherry red, they're no longer giving off smoke if I pull them out of the fire. This is pretty much pure coke at this point. That's the stuff we want. This is the stuff we're trying to get rid of. Uh, but there's enough nice blow in there now. I think we can go ahead and get to work uh, on our pieces for the day. So we'll take our piece of metal. What we're gonna do here is we're gonna heat up about the first maybe two inches of this piece of metal and we're gonna draw a point on it, which is simply turning that uh, 90 degree cut on the end into a nice, pretty, much more aesthetically pleasing point. So I'll just shove this in here in our fire. Try to get it where it'll sit put. All right, so we can get busy with a little hitting here. Again, I'm just gonna try to draw the point down on this tool. goes um, and uh, I'm gonna go ahead and heat this piece up further than you should uh, just to illustrate something that most people don't necessarily know and that is that metal will in fact burn if it gets hot enough uh, and what it'll look like is kind of a like a 4th of July sparkler so I'm gonna get this to happen here in the fire real quick I think that tip is small enough it should heat up really quick and I'll pull that out and show you what it looks like all right there you go that's what that looks like See all the little sparks coming off of there? And the problem is it really makes the metal kind of pour. It causes an overabundance of scaling, and uh, the metal actually becomes kind of uh, like, like dough, if you will, and so you kind of have to, it makes it almost harder to work with than it was initially. I'm just trying to get a little bit more, just a little bit prettier curve to this tip so it's not as obvious when we test curve. Uh... Alright, good enough. Now what I'm going to do next is kind of push that through the fire more than I had been uh, to essentially heat not just the tip, uh, but a good three or four inches of it and we'll pull that out and uh, bend it on the, uh, the horn of the anvil uh, to make one side of our S-curve. Or S-hook, sorry. Right. Let's go ahead and do a one side of our bend and then we'll quench this in, swap around and do the other side to make the S hook. So the trick here is you kind of try to estimate, you know, how far around you want to go to leave material on the other side. And just kind of break it on around the anvil. Since this isn't uh, quite as big a curve as I want, I'd like to get it up to about here somewhere. I'll probably end up opening this a little bit by reheating it. Uh, I'm going to try to now soak just this area here so that it's red, so that we can move that curve on around. Sorry, I just realized uh, some of the excitement there may have been out of frame. Uh, don't worry, I've adjusted the camera and we'll get the rest of it in here. Hopefully we'll do the other side where you can see it. All right, so now I've got the tip's not quite as hot and we've got this area here. Uh, nice and hot, so I'm going to go ahead and move it on around my horn. And we'll tap him up a little bit to open that back up again. See if we can change this curve. You'll notice that it's kind of warping. That's because this isn't, you know, a straight piece. You've got infinite variability of your curve, but it does tend to put a taper on the thing. So every now and then you'll see me pound it uh, back flat again to try to get a better look at where we stand. All right, that looks a little better. I'm going to move a little bit more curve in. All right, hopefully last heat on this side. That looks pretty good. Alright, we're going to go. 
go ahead and quench this. Put a little more of taper. And then we'll flip it around and do the other side. Here's some excitement, so I'll grab the camera and everybody can enjoy the ooh-ah moment here. Hot uh, metal going into the cold water. Just like you'd think it would do. Alright, we're going to do the point on the other side of zoomed in a little bit. Maybe you get a better look at what's going on here. Again, I'll just uh, now I'm going to try to heat up area somewhere you know about this big, and we'll go around the uh, go around the horn again. This time in the other direction. All right, so we'll see if we can spin this one around the horn. It let us have uh, switched out now. I've got some uh, tongs I'm working with. That's because uh, the more I work this piece in, the uh, less distance there is between the hot metal and my hand. Got to the point where there's really not a safe place to hang on to this piece of metal anymore. Close. We're going to go back in and bend up this section. Uh, oh, I did it again. Well, I'll show you again in a second here, but uh, I'm going to heat up this end and see if we can make that curve go on around some more. I believe we did that twice. All right, we're going to see if we can uh, finish this side of the bend. center up on this little section here and just bend more and it simply adds more to the circle if you can picture that. Anything I move around the horn like that gets added to the curve. That looks pretty good. Now I'm just going to see if I can clean them up. See how quickly the water evaporates off of there. That's a leading indicator that uh, you still don't want to touch that sucker. And I think he's about done. So there you have it. Standard uh, trick of the trade making S hooks. Now, uh, one thing that does seem to inevitably happen when I have people out to the shed 
and um, they want to play with metal is they I usually start them on a on an S hook and they enjoy themselves. I usually use some uh, quarter inch that this is I'm sorry some uh, eighth inch stuff. This is a quarter inch piece of steel. Um, it's a half inch. Um, what they inevitably end up, they go, they make their small S hook and they get all excited and they say, okay, well, I want to make something bigger. Um, and that pretty look, that probably did look pretty easy. I mean, you get a single soak, usually you can get the tip put on it. Um, but it, I guess what I wanted to point out is the bigger the metal gets, this might be obvious, the bigger the metal gets, the harder it is to move, even if it's just as hot. I mean, this stuff doesn't turn into Play Doh. Uh, so I'm just going to kind of. Get an example of that I'm going to get a nice big piece of metal here and just put a nice heat on the end of it and I'm going to hit it pretty pretty hard even with a bigger hammer than this and you'll see it's just not going to move like the little less stuff does okay uh, what I found is a big piece of one inch uh, steel uh, and this thing's basically going to laugh at me while I try to uh, put a tip or some semblance of cause movement in the metal uh, at the end of this piece hopefully I've got a pretty good soak here it should hold on to its heat a little bit better uh, than the small steel does, but um, this is still going to be um, steel one, there's nothing. as much of a devilment as I could put on that thing uh, and that soak and this thing's already getting warm there's so much heat required on these bigger pieces that this thing's already warm up here at the other end uh, I don't have a set of tongs that's going to hold this uh, so I just thought I'd let you see that's a it's a two and a half pound sledge and some big overhand stuff going into this guy and he's just, he's just laughing at me so don't expect can't really move metal that fast uh, without some heavy equipment, uh, which I haven't built yet. Up until recently, I didn't know anybody who uh, sold inexpensive uh, motors. We solved that problem. Anyway, I'm gonna I'm gonna quench this and we'll move on to our third experiment. Okay, last bit of fun and excitement. Uh, we remember our piece of uh, 01 tool steel. Um, this is also called drill rod. Uh, and it comes in what's called a uh, normalized state, which is to say you can, you can do stuff with it. I cut this by hand with a hacksaw, for instance. Uh, and just to show you, uh, it's still fairly soft metal. I'm going to take a file, just a standard bastard file. And we'll just, you can see I can easily make a nick in that, in that uh, steel. And again, I could take a saw, for instance, and hack it off if I needed to, like I did before. The point being, it's soft at this point. It's, it's, it's not a tool. You couldn't use it as a drill bit or anything at this point. You couldn't use it as a punch. It's not hard. So uh, most people have heard the terms uh, quench and uh, temper. Uh, temper uh, is the one that people, I think, think of the most when they're talking about hard steel or, or soft steel. Um, Tempering doesn't make things harder. Tempering makes things softer. And to be very specific, the way the process works is when you heat the metal up to a particular temperature, it's called its austenizing, the Martin site temperature, um, there's a temperature at which the molecular structure of the steel, am I boring anybody yet, moves apart enough, the atoms move apart enough 
that carbon atoms can move into that lattice structure. And that's the whole point of quench, is you want to get the metal just hot enough to get what available carbon there is to move into the structure, and then you want to freeze it in that state as fast as you can. So what you do is you beat the metal up to a certain temperature. Um, for most non-alloy metals, uh, it's the it, it happens to be the temperature at which the metal becomes uh, non-magnetic, so it's fairly easy to find with just a, just a magnet. Um, so you'll heat the thing up until it becomes non-magnetic, and then quench it as fast as you can. So uh, today I'll probably just uh, stuff it into the, the uh, ice water over here. Uh, now since this is all going to happen fairly quickly, I thought I'd just carry you guys over here with me. So here's our, uh, here's our little piece of steel. And he's starting to get nice and cheery. In fact, we probably are getting close. There's a magnet I keep up here. And you can, I can feel that sticking. That's close. A little bit, just a little bit. Fire. I don't know how well that's going to come out on the camera. Hopefully you can see how varying levels of heat we've got down in there. Alright, that looks pretty good out of the tip at least. Alright, I'm going to go ahead and quench this. Okay, so what should have happened here is we should have taken a piece of metal, that uh, this is the rear end of it, where we could essentially score it with the file to our heart's content because it's soft. And uh, now we, sh yeah, what you can hear there, it's called skating. And you can see, I'm not, I'm not even starting to make it, in fact, I'm dulling, you can see real close, I'm actually dulling the edge of this file by even trying to do this on this piece. And that's called, they call that skating, the, the file is skating. It's essentially this piece of metal, the, the piece we hardened is now harder than the, the bastard file. So if I just run this straight down the middle, this is a quasi cheap one, can actually see if I get the light right you'll see the scoring mark where that just dulled the bastard file. Now what's interesting about carbon steels is this is a reversible process so this is where tempering comes in. If I take this piece of metal and hit it move over here to the, to the pritchet hole this big square hole in the anvil can't see it. That big square hole whoop, in the anvil. It's called a Pritchett hole. Uh, various tools go in it. We're not using any of those today. And uh, if I take this piece of metal and position it over this so that I can attempt to break it, uh, it's, it's probably going to be exciting. It'll probably send a piece of this uh, line all around the room. If I can hit it right. One more time. There it goes. So, essentially, this is so hard now that when I strike it, it has no ability to flex at all. So if it's struck in the right spot, it just breaks. And if you could, if you could see this really close, you'd see a very fine grainy structure, almost like broken cast iron looks. Um, that's what they call grain growth in the metal, it's because it got essentially too hot and was quenched at too high of a temperature. Um, but essentially, we've now taken this piece of metal and it's no longer soft. I could bend this side, I could just bend this side around the anvil. But this side, if I hit it too hard, it's just going to snap. It's going to break right off like a piece of glass. Um, and the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to polish this back up so that it looks like this and we'll talk a little bit about uh, tempering. Okay. So what I've done is I've uh, kind of just taken a piece of sandpaper and cleaned up this metal so that you can see its uh, appearance again. You need to be able to see this, um, well, to do what we're about to do here, which is a, a kind of a visual temper, the way uh, things have been done for ages ago. Um, for the O1 tool steel, to get uh, like a decent tool, workable tool, you want to temper back to about 400 degrees. The tempering process somewhat reverses the capturing of the uh, the uh, 
atoms, the carbon atoms inside the structure. So essentially what we do is we loosen it back up uh, to a certain uh, hardness. So essentially we quench, we get it as hard as we can, or at least beyond the hardness we want, and then we essentially temper it back to the actual hardness that the tool really needs to have to be useful. Uh, for springs, uh, that's going to be a somewhat higher temperature. Uh, for axes, it'll be a somewhat lower temperature, uh, but it, it, it varies. Um, and what you'll see is, uh, hopefully, as I do this, is uh, I've, got a, I've got a butane torch here um, that we'll be using. Uh, and uh, what I'll do is, don't need the uh, ad exhaust fan anymore, so hopefully we don't have to yell at each other anymore. Um, as I heat this, hopefully what you'll see is uh, the color of the steel will change. Now what's happening is uh, the external part of the steel is, is oxidizing and that causes uh, a variation in the, the steel structure on the outside and it causes the steel to change color. Um, that color can actually indicate temperature to us. So what we'll see is I'm going to try to get it heated so that we'll see a, a striping effect. So the tip I'll probably go as far as blue or violet and uh, as it goes through there you'll see it uh, kind of go yellow and then it'll start to move into blue. And I'm just going to do that to kind of show the effect. But this is how, in the old, this is how Blacksmith would have said, well, I need a, a tool that's going to be a spring. He'd have made the device uh, first and then he would have quenched it to harden it and then he would have tempered it. Usually they, what they would have done was heated a, a piece of bulk metal uh, and just laid the piece on there and watched the whole thing essentially heat up to whatever temperature they want and then they just kick the whole thing off into the quench tank again. Um, they didn't have whiz-bang butane torches. So hopefully I'll keep this in frame and hopefully I see a fair amount of reflection in the camera so hopefully this will work out pretty good. Now you should be seeing a little bit of straw. Hopefully that's coming through. And now we're moving to blue. And you should be able to see that blue on the end. It's kind of a purple effect. Very bright blue, almost like the tip of the butane torch. And you can see that straw color now climbing up the piece of metal. If I allow this, it'll make this tip useless. In fact, that tip's moving towards being useless it's from, hard, from a hardened standpoint already. And we've got about you know knife edge here. This would be better for spring. If you continue heating this, you'll see that temperature move on up the piece. So again, the trick really is to get the whole piece the same temperature at the same time. Uh, these days, uh, like for instance when I make a knife blade, uh, I do this in an oven. So it's a much more controlled uh, in environment. The whole thing gets the heat all at once and you don't have to worry about any warping or spot problems where part of it gets, <coughs> part of it gets harder or softer than the rest. And uh, that's pretty much it uh, for today's demo. Hope everybody enjoyed that. And uh, Bruce will be turning the tape off and hopefully answering any questions anybody's got.